Welcome back, everybody. Great to have you with us on the program today, This Week in America, online, thisweekinamerica.us. It's a fascinating coffee table book, A Bridge with a House, Oregon's Covered Bridges by Stephen E. Honeycutt. Excellent photography, a slice of history, a look at the romantic historical structures of our past. It's a quick view of the state's covered bridges, the history and facts of those covered bridges, a labor of love for Stephen, who enjoys taking on creative projects, always learning, always exploring. The book, A Bridge with a House, Oregon's Covered Bridges by Stephen E. Honeycutt, our guest on today's This Week in America. Steve, welcome to the program. Looking forward to this. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for asking me. This is such a great book, great photography, really interesting uh, points of history that you bring out in the book. And I as I understand this, what's interesting is you didn't start out to write a book. This was what a family album that all of a sudden grew into this great compilation of the, the covered bridges of the state of Oregon. That's what it turned into is my wife's aunt. Uh, she lived about 20 miles from us in a place called Cottage Grove and didn't know what to get her for Christmas. So we went down. I started taking pictures of the old high school, her home and everything. And then I went after the covered bridges. There's six of them there. It's a major attraction. And we put together this little album as a Christmas gift, and she enjoyed it. And one thing led to another is what it amounted to. <laughs> well, yeah, and then you got family and friends saying, you know, you really need to do a book. Once you starting, started to, to put these together, talk about that process, because it was more than just going county by county and taking pictures. You did a lot of research on the bridges as well. Talk about the, the process of, of getting around to, to do the book. To do the book, they're spread throughout pretty much my side of the country, my side of the state. We call it I-5. And as I said, we went county by county as day trips. And I'd go on the computer, get the locations, hand them to my wife, and we'd take off and go. I had about four cameras with me. Two of them were 35s and two were digital. That, that brought a lot of humor. People would ask me, do you know how many cameras you got? <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I have four. Do you need all them? And I said, I thought I got to the point, says, am I bothering anybody here? And they thought he smiled and left. Um, I took all these pictures. It was probably 150 pictures per bridge. I put them in a family album, organized it and everything. And then over a period of time, family looking at the pictures and say, what are you going to do with this? And I said, I don't know. And finally, someone says, why don't you do a book? And I says, I'm not a publisher. I'm not a writer. So my wife bugged me. So I went through and picked out certain pictures. And then I just started going on the computer again and doing my research. And found that I wanted to make it brief. What's this bridge build of? Um, what's the history? Brief, just something simple. And so that's what I ended up doing through all the 51 covered bridges that we have out here. I looked online for other books to try to help me, but the other books on covered bridges is a paperback book with old black and white pictures and a bunch of talking. And I figured no, and so I wanted a, a covered book, a, 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 a coffee table book, excuse me. In learning about these bridges, here's something that's interesting. The bridges actually began in ancient Babylon, I found out. And this is in 780 B.C. And I'm going, how in the world would anybody know that? Well, ancient Babylon is 53 miles south of Baghdad, in Iraq. And so that's where, you know, covered bridges began. In this country here, it was in 1804 in Connecticut that we had the first covered bridge. And in my state, Oregon, the first covered bridge started in 18, was in 1851. The heyday, as they called it, the covered bridges in my state was 1905 to 1925. We had 450 covered bridges. Today, in 2018, we only have 51. So back to the book, and this is kind of like a lesson to be learned, as I found out, as you do everything. Once I got it all put together felt comfortable with it, I started looking for a publisher. And that can really be difficult. So I picked the publisher. And we worked together and everything. We got the book published. But the problem was with this publisher, they wanted $90 for the book. And they did not want to really help me get it into the stores. And so after about five years, I got mad and a publisher called me, the one that I'm using now, and they said, hey, we can do this, we can do it for less, and we can do with what you want. 
And so the book that you're talking about is the second version out. The cover has been changed. The title was shortened thanks to my wife. And it is now, the goal is, can I have it in a store, physically in a store? And so Barnes & Noble out here in Eugene, Oregon, are going to put it in the store. But they got a kick out of how brief I was and how simple it was. It's all broken down by counties when you open up my book. It has tidbits of information about the covered bridges in general. Why are they painted red or why are they... Why well, they that's what's fascinating because so many questions and how they became so popular, the lifespan of a covered bridge as opposed to a bridge, why the railroad decided they really liked to cover the bridges because they last longer and would prevent literally trains from going into the water when, when, the, when the bridge would give out. So you've got some, some real interesting history. When I said brief pieces of history, this is not like a historical text. There's just enough to, to keep you interested in, and give you information on those bridges. See, it's a house, but really what it is is a barn. Yes. It was used actually for farm animals to cross rushing water. They're afraid of rush, rushing water. So what they did was they put a building over it, made it look like a barn, and so the animals thought they were going into a barn when, in essence, they were crossing a river. And that's why you mentioned, red. yeah, you mentioned that being painted red. That was what the main reason many of these are painted red, to give the illusion of, of being a barn. Right. But I don't know if an animal can tell colors or not, but, you know, they, they did that. But, you know, we use Douglas fir out here. It's very abundant. But they didn't want to cover the bridges to count in different counties because it cost too much money. Well, the taxpayers wanted to protect their investments. So what they did was they petitioned the county to start covering them, and that's what they did. They finally started covering them. If you don't cover a bridge out here in the Pacific Northwest, as we are known, <laughs> yes. it is literally going to be no good after eight years. But once you put that cover on, then it's going to last 80 to 90 years. And today they're lasting longer because in the 1980s, the state of Oregon created a department to go out there and preserve these covered bridges and not let them just disappear. Because if you go from 450 down to 51, that's, that's very sad. In your state of Indiana, if I'm not mistaken, you have the most covered bridges of all the states in your state. And in Oregon, Lane County, where I live, we have the most covered bridges west of the Mississippi of any county. We've got 20 sitting out here. So, you know, but you, you look at these bridges and you talk history and whatnot. We have a bridge called the Fortner Cover Bridge. It's the only one that's on private property. A, uh, the husband and wife built this bridge to cross the river. It was done in the 1930s. Today, you can visit that bridge. You've got to ask permission, but you can't walk on it. You walk on it, you're going to go right down into the river. And I don't know if it's still standing today. I've been unable to find out. When you're looking at the histories of these bridges, uh, their names. Most of the time, a covered bridge was named by the creek or stream in which they cross. But over time, they started naming for a family, for a very famous person in that area. They'd name them for a town. They'd even name them for a mountain that was around there, and that's what they became known as. Uh, we've got one one bridge it's called the gallon house covered bridge and it was used as a pigeon drop now most people today would not know what a pigeon drop is a pigeon drop is actually prohibition time so they had these two towns connected by this covered bridge one of the towns was wet and one of the towns was dry so the town that had liquor or white lightning would do a gallon of the white lightning go onto the bridge and put it on the dry side of the bridge <laughs> and then these people would come and get it and so it became known as the gallon house you have one called five rivers covered bridge and the reason it's called five rivers there are five streams that come together to form this name and this is the only place in the united states where this has happened there is no other place in the united states where you've got five streams all coming together so this is something unique, which a lot of people don't know. Um, most people in my state don't know that we have this many covered bridges. Most people in Oregon, probably in other states, do not know their state. I can believe that, yes. Out here, out here they want to go to California, to Disneyland, and all this other good stuff, or, you know, to Florida, to the other one. But when you ask them, and if they're native like I am, how much of this state have you seen? They have it. I grew up here except for my time in the service, and I did camping with my folks. 
I've been married 36 years. My wife and I take off and go in this state. We just go. We don't know where we're going, but we're going. And it was just like when we went and looked for all 51 covered bridges. I don't, I, I don't even think you can count on one hand. I don't think there's five people that have seen all 51. We have a society in the state of Oregon called the Covered Bridge Society of Oregon. Uh, they were not very helpful because this was a tight-knit group. And when I was doing this research, I got a hold of them. And then I learned, forget it, just goodbye, you know, because I was stepping on their toes. That's all right. <laughs> so that, I, I just, you know, I believe in Oregon. I believe in tourism. I believe in promoting my state. But I take offense when people come here and they don't see this state. See, that's the gift that I'm giving to people with this book that, they, that they're going to find. It's, well, yeah, it's, it's, like, it, it's like a travel guide, isn't it? Because you break this down, you've got maps in there, you've got directions. So if you are in the state and you want to look for them, it's all right there for you. Information, how to get there. If you're traveling in from another state and going to spend a couple of days in Oregon, once again, it's all right there. You've got the directions. You tell us exactly where to get there and what to look for and a little bit of the history of the bridges. Yes, but I also, and as I said, the gift is you're going to see Oregon. Yes, yes. You're going to be on the blue highway, the back roads. And I read a book many years ago. Somebody took the blue highways from the East Coast out to the West Coast. It was fascinating. What's on the back roads, which you don't see of this country, and it's true in this state. You're going to find waterfalls. You're going to see wildlife. You're even going to find the remnants of old towns where people don't exist anymore even by the bridges. You are going to literally go back in time and see this state. And everybody wants to come to Oregon. It is simply amazing how many people want to come, and they really don't see it. And so I did this book. You know, I didn't do this book to make money. I didn't do this book for anything except my little bucket list, but I'm not making a bucket list because I'm getting older. I have a bucket list throughout my whole life. In that bucket, I wanted to say I published a book on Oregon, and I got it into a store. That's all I'm asking, and that's all I ever wanted to do. You want to be rich? Go ask J.K. Rollins. <laughs> you want to be rich? And look at what she went through. Exactly. But you go, to, you go through these bridges. You know, let's talk to homeless that we have today across the country. We had tramps back in those days, and where do you think the tramps slept? They slept on the bridges because they were covered. So, you know, that's a part that people do not remember and what have you. Uh, these bridges were built by the state. They were built by a company. They were built by towns. They were built by individuals. It's actually a New England influence when you start researching the covered bridges out here. It's an influence. That well, that's interesting have. to find out who built them. And basically, anybody did. Like you said, you've got individuals, you've got companies that built them, you've got governments there that, that built them. And they became sort of a social part of the community, didn't they? they you say it wasn't just simple conveyance. It, it was much more than that. They became part of the community. They had weddings on well, these bridges. They had they meetings. They had weddings, political rallies. They had yes. religious meetings. They had town meetings. You know, they even used them for kissing. <laughs> because it's secluded, and so the young people could go and do their kissing, and nobody would see them, and they'd be left alone, you know? It was just amazing, you know, what these bridges did and how much they were part of the history of this state or the history of any state. When you start, if you dig into just one part of the history of your state, and that's what I'm trying to do with this book, Uncovered Bridges, I'm going to open the door you're going to see more of the history of this state. You're going to learn, and you're not realizing that you're learning about your state. Well, that's a nice okay. thing. It, yeah, it's entertaining. You're reading, you're enjoying the pictures, you're enjoying the, the brief dialogue that gives you an explanation for what it is that you're seeing. The book we're talking about is called A Bridge with a House, Oregon's Covered Bridges by Stephen E. Honeycutt. That's H-U-N-N-I-C-U-T-T. The book is available at Amazon, five-star review. You can find it at bookventure.com in their bookstore. We'll have links on our website, thisweekinamerica.us, so you can, uh, you can find the book. It is a, an excellent read. And what's interesting is, as I'm reading this and looking, the, the different structures, you even had a bridge that was equipped with a, a fire protection sprinkler system in it. And there's also one equipped with a toilet. <laughs> and there's also a couple that have walkways 
where you can do it. But the other part in this book that people are going to get a kick out of is there's a chapter. Not all covered bridges are covered Yes, bridges. I was going to ask you about that, that next. That confuses people. Well, what it is, you have a truss. That's what the bridge is. Different ways you can make a bridge across a creek or whatever you, you need, okay? And there's a, a truss. There's a how, a king sport, and a queen sport. And what it is is how the wood is put together in the length. The king sport is probably the long. You know, trees only grow so long. And a king sport uses the longest trees in the support. But you have to have a how which was H-O-W-E, which was out here in the Northwest, was most common. We've got one, maybe two bridges as queen sport, but that's for smaller bridges, much, much smaller bridges, okay? So you have to have this. We have a Milo, uh, Milo Academy uh, covered bridge in Douglas County, built by the Seventh-day Adventist, but it's not a covered bridge. What it is is a steel structure. And then you got wood around it, but the state of Oregon calls it a covered bridge. It does not meet the stipulations of what a covered bridge is. You've got uh, uh, one in Bend, and where really what it is is cross a ditch, is what it amounts to. And he says it looks like the good pasture bridge that we have out here in Lane County. I'd have to be drunk in order to get that conclusion. <laughs> but what that looks like that, it's not going to be. So I actually dealt in further than what anybody else had done. I have a problem. I like doing projects, and I like using my head. I was a warehouseman. I worked in retail and uh, in the warehouses. And I sit in my den when that right now, everybody says it's cluttered. I don't care. And I do this research. I just sit down all of a sudden, wait, what about this? Or what about that? It's just like, you know, Babylon. What do you mean Babylon? So then I had to sidetrack and figure out, okay, yes. how they know that. And that's the only thing I do. I just keep, you keep digging. But with this book, that's what I want people to do. Go at your own pace. It's a pick-up, put-down book. Go at your own pace. And you're going to find out that you can go on vacation with your family, and it's not going to cost an arm and a leg. And why do you need to sit in an amusement park when you can sit out in the open? The fresh, the sounds of the wildlife. You're going to see a deer go walking by. Parts of this country, you might even see a bear. They're not going to bother you. They're going to walk by and shake their head and go. <laughs> But, I mean, you know, it just, it became a passion. And like I said, i got to get this out. The lesson learned, the lesson learned, and everybody wants to publish a book, is, one, can you find the right publisher? I first off did not. I have since found the right publisher. Two, it's not cheap to publish a book. I don't care what you publish. You're going to be spending anywhere from 20 Oops. buy those books. A full-page ad like what I did was $8,000. So you have to be committed into what you're doing, and you have to, as I said before, don't go in here thinking you're going to get rich because it isn't going to happen. It's all in the stock market if you want to get a comparison. I did this for passion. I'm an Oregonian, and I love my steak. I just, I, I can, I, I go you know, my <laughs> wife and I go. We go check out the lighthouses. We do a whole bunch of things. Well, you your know? passion comes through. It's come through during the course of the program and in the book. And it's a real coffee table book. You pick it up. You look at it. You're entertained. Your imagination. And that's one thing as you're talking about visiting all these bridges. You, your imagination can run wild as you picture what it was like during the heyday after the bridge was built and, and what happened on that particular structure. And you get the guidance on that from, from the book. The book is called A Bridge with a House, Oregon's Covered Bridges by Stephen E. Honeycutt. Mentioned his publisher, Book Venture. If you go to their website, bookventure.com, in the bookstore, you'll get information there on how to purchase the book. Books available at Amazon, five-star reviews. It soon will be available in bookstores in, uh, in Oregon and hopefully around the country as well. Stephen, it was a pleasure having a chance to, uh, to look at the book. You did an excellent job with the text and, of course, with the pictures. Uh, it was just a pleasant trip down memory lane looking at these, uh, these structures and, and finding out about them. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. Uh, best of luck with the book. Thank you very much. You're listening to This Week in America online, thisweekinamerica.us. Our guest in the program, Stephen Honeycutt, author of the book, A Bridge with a House, Oregon's Covered Bridges.
And we're back right after these messages. <laughs> 